Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Transfer Talk. This is Raj from 3CB Performance, joined as always by Adam Vogie. How's it going, man? I'm pretty good. How about you? Happy Friday. Likewise, likewise. Hey, not too bad, man, considering some of these transfer lunch we're seeing for Arsenal. And so the one we want to discuss first and foremost, because it's probably the, the big money move, is Rafinha from Leeds United. So firstly, as we always do, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna have you give just a little bit of background on the player and your just general opinion of him, and then we'll get into some of the more details. Sure, yeah, Rafinha is is one of those guys who I think, um, you know, very very uh, commonly stand player by uh, supporters of the like the bigger clubs in the Premier League. Uh, he's been in the Premier League for two years, if you didn't know that already, both for Leeds United, came from uh, Rennes in France, and before that came from Sporting in Portugal, he, but he is Brazilian, uh, he's 25, he'll turn 26 around Christmas this year, um, so so he's a more experienced guy, I think he's got, um, if you count Sporting, and he w- went on a loan to Vitoria, which is another uh, decent-sized club in Portugal, I think it's like five or six uh, senior seasons under his belt. So he's, I mean, he's an experienced guy. He's a Brazil national teamer. Um, I would say he's probably, probably in the, in the regular starting three at this point, uh, usually Vinicius jr. On the other side, uh, Gabriel Jesus as the striker. So, um, I mean, that's a big deal, right? That Brazil has no shortage of, of great attackers. Um, look at like other guys, even who are just in the transfer market, Anthony, uh, wanted by Manchester United, of course, Neymar haven't even said his name <laughs> and uh, we've already five deep there. So um, he's, he's a very interesting player. He's fun to watch. Um, and, you know, I feel bad for him because leads were awful this season. He needed Jordan Bamford. He needed somebody um, in the attack. I think the next best attacker probably ended up being like Dan James. So pretty rough. Yeah. He's pretty much you know, kind of left out there by himself also are you saying let's say if jesus comes and rafinha does that mean um neymar is next <laughs> or, or <Vinicius? laughs> he's available for the right price so right we'll right see. now i mean that's just an interesting length let's say i think jesus is going to get done him knowing rafinha if that does add to that potential right and we know with brazilians they tend to like be they tend to like to go with where there's other people that they know and that, that, that's general but it yeah. isn't you know that's, that's an interesting potential kind of, uh, communication. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's total speculation on my part, but, um, having, having Gabriel Martinelli and Gabriel Magalhães in the, yeah. the starting 11, uh, or at least, you know, the, the first 12, 13, right. That can't hurt. Those guys are both somewhat regular features over the past calendar year for Brazil. Um, and, and, uh, we've, we've heard kind of similar storylines. I never know what's true and what's not, but at least there are like not you know, better than ITK type Twitter accounts, like actual reporters who have said that um, Rafinha and Jesus both are uh, are more attracted to, to Arsenal than kind of some some roughly parallel clubs. I know that that Spurs have Champions League this this season, but you do wonder if the Brazilian influence might be there. Kind of reminds me back in the day, like LeBron and D Wade and Chris Bosh lining up their move to Miami because they're all buds. Um, no doubt that these guys are friends. They've played at least 10 national team games together. So, yeah, I think, I think that obviously the friends part, the cultural aspect, especially the fact that you're away from it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think I, I don't know if it's as pertinent as it used to be, um, but I f- figure they're still human and there's still that psychological aspect regardless. And so, you know, yeah. Brazil, Brazil FC, here we come. And so, okay. But now getting into his radar a bit and some of the data kind of, you know, what sticks out to you firstly, as you know, strengths, weaknesses and then you know things to work on for him yeah so the so the heat map um that i put together for this video is his entire time at Leeds. so this is over two seasons um and he i mean the huge standout uh i I kind of intentionally do some of these things that are very qualitative in nature and some that are more quantitative so you look at like his touches per 90 i mean he's he's getting onto the ball for leads they use him as a bit of a focal point in their attack Mm -hmm. uh, compared Mm -hmm. to other wingers and attacking midfielders um, so it is really encouraging to see that he's almost touching the line for expected assists. Uh, you look at kind of the, the Google level stats for him this past season, and he had three assists. So you're like, well, you know, that's not good. Um, but he did, uh, he did finish expected assists closer to eight. So, um, I guess like a very basic way to explain that is his teammates let him down at least 
roughly five times over the course of the season when he should have had some assists. Um, his, you know, he, he has ability to score uh, slightly above average in terms of like an XG, usually kind of right around uh, his XG in terms of like how good of a finisher he is, which mm-hmm. for a winger does make him slightly above average at that. Um, for me, I mean, two things really come to mind right away, dribbling and, and playmaking. And I think that really shows through here with the key passes uh, on the other side, a lot of dribbles per 90, but kind of like in the classic, like vibes kind of playing style of a, of a Brazilian, not to lump them all in together. He does lose a lot of dribbles too, because he attempts a lot. Um, this past season, he also was drawing multiple defenders because where else was the threat, uh, in that attack? So those are the things that really stand out to me the most. Um, and you know, I think one thing that's important to note on him is that when I ran a, a winger, uh, like a, a formula for wingers, um, I did adjust my, my turnovers to per touch. So he has a very high number of touches for people on that list. Um, and also a very low number of at least dispossessions, which is going to be more once he's already on the ball and he loses it. Whereas miscontrols is usually more like down to like your first touch. Uh, failing to properly trap the ball and just losing it, that sort of thing. So it seems like once he's on the ball, kind of hard to get him off of it, which I think is a very good trait to have for a club who might want to dominate possession. So those are the things that kind of stand out to me. Um, You know, not pressing much uh, would make him fit right in with everybody except for Odegaard on the attack right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we'll see. I mean, Saka and Smith Rowe, Martinelli less so. um, Don't really put up a lot of numbers there. Martinelli is a lot better, but We'll see if that's more of a system thing um, where Leeds might not be pushing him to, to press that much. The rest of them do have very high pressing numbers, though, so that is significant to know, too. Yeah, and then the key thing, the context here, like you said, is I mean, these are with the XA numbers, especially key pass numbers are all impressive. And that's like you said, that's having two, three you know, eyes of defenders on him, if not two physical defenders Try and get, you know, doubling him to get him off the ball, considering Bamford was gone for most of the season. He didn't really have any support in that attacking third. And he was still able to put up these numbers. And that that really speaks to his level of talent. And then just generally, like you said, you know, as a Brazilian with some of that dribbling flair, he brings some of that takedown ability that Arsenal has tended to lack over the last few years. And that yeah. you sometimes you want to see from some of their winners as well, which is also might be why, you know, you know, Arteta is so he wants to bring that different type of uh, player onto the team to add that different layer. So really, really interesting here. And mm-hmm. like you said, leads were terrible last year. So it was just, <clears throat> and the fact that he's still able to have relative success within that team is, is, is to me, is pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. And to, to, um, just to kind of add on to this, I think one thing about him is that he, uh, this past season especially, would tend to make more out of what he had than a lot of other players would have been able to. Uh, it's one thing to be on Manchester City and to be a 90th percentile expected assist guy, right? Because they're going to generate chance after chance after chance for the yeah. whole game. Yeah. All you got to do is be the guy with the ball some of the time, and you're probably going to have some decent uh, numbers there. Um, whereas with leads, um, to be and a 90th percentile expected assist guy where they are not going to be, uh, they're roughly like mid table in terms of XG that does speak to some efficiency, um, making more out of the chances that you're given. And, and one, I think one stat that kind of illustrates that is he is a like 70, 75 percentile guy in terms of number of touches, um, for every segment of the pitch until the attacking third, and it drops down to 57th percentile. So, mm-hmm. uh, he gets more touches further away from the goal than most wingers. And does still end up with more expected assists, which I find to be kind of speaking to that efficiency. That's really interesting. That's also, and then also speaks to maybe his ability to play in some of those, you know, those pockets that are, you know, farther away from goal that you may not realize. I think when you think Rafinha, what do I immediately think? I think of what we just talked about taking on players, but I think that data you brought up really speaks to his ability of being comfortable more so in that build-up play and not just in that final third and creating some of those pockets. And we know with Mikel and his system, he likes a lot of those, those interchanges, right? Get in, get in and out of pockets and zones quickly. And so that could bode well. I mean, I just generally when I watch him play, I mean, he's obviously we know he's dynamic. But he's also a smart, effective, efficient player. And I think you put him around like-minded guys and he can really, really thrive 
and he just ha- and he has that he has that, that that dynamic you know some of that dynamicism that you that that can just change a game for you at times right and we know those finest of margins can be the difference between one two three points and you know over the course of a, of a whole season can really add up yeah I think adding adding a player with his um, his passion and his his level of uh, experience is is clearly kind of the blueprint uh, that Mikel Arteta seems to be following and and Adu uh, this summer because um, to me there were times especially in kind of that last ten game stretch got some impressive results but also there were some times when when they look spooked um, and you know that's that's going to happen when your best player is twenty one and he's been playing too much football for a year. Um, guys like Smith Rowe Martinelli looked maybe a little bit not ready for that moment. So uh, I think that's kind of part of why we look for these guys who are kind of like junkyard dogs on the pitch. And he's definitely like that. He's a passionate, passionate player. So, yeah. And if for those who are, you know, listening or watching, if you haven't seen that picture of Rafinha with the crowd, right. When they weren't relegated, I think that, I, mean, I think he, he, he I already, already liked, I already liked him alive, heard a lot about his mentality, but then you saw how he handled himself during their relegation battle and kind of how his obvious joy and excitement and how committed he was that earned a lot of respect for me that, you know, he has incredible commitment to the club that he's playing for. And, and then it, Obviously, it's we see it on the pitch with his commitment, but you also see it kind of off the pitch with with how invested he was with Leeds staying mm-hmm. up. All right, and uh, moving into kind of the last aspect is where's he going to play? And so mm-hmm. for that is I'll let you go into it's going to I'll bring up the heat map here, then I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, I mean at, at Leeds, where where does he play or where has he played? It's almost exclusively as right wing, or if they going more of like a four, four, two type of formation. It's like the right midfielder. Um, either way, I look at that as a wing player, uh, mm-hmm. exterior player on the right. Um, he's uh, that's where he's been most often deployed. As I, as I uh, said earlier in Brazil's kind of a one lineup, um, Vinicius jr. Is like, I mean, he's one of the best players in the world. He picks where he plays, right? He plays the left wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not going to change. So uh, he's on the right for Brazil most of the time. Now, early in his career, uh, when he was coming up through Portugal, when he went on loan to Vitoria, he did play left wing almost exclusively for them. Um, interesting because he is a left footer, right? So he's he's not going to be able to cut it and take the shots on the right foot like, uh, I, you know, somebody like, I don't know, Cody Gakpo might be able to. Um, so it kind of it kind of raises a lot of questions for me, right? The Arsenal's best player who is currently legally employed by the team is Bukayo Saka, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that he is a better right winger than left winger, uh, particularly because he also seems to like cutbacks the most. Uh, so it does raise a question for me is, is the idea to play Rafinha right Saka left? Is it the other way around? Is it for Rafinha to be uh first understudy winger? I mean, for six, if, if this deal pushes over 55 million pounds, um, which it seems like it's going to, uh, you definitely get the vibe that he's not coming in as competition. At least that's my opinion. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. I think we might see a very fluid front three, uh, especially if if Jesus not you know touch wood, he probably is based on what we're hearing today coming in as well. You might have three guys who are covering the entire width of the pitch the entire ma- the entire match. So it's going to be really interesting to see. I do think that um, you'll get plenty of Martinelli on one wing with Rafinha on the other wing, Saka, Martinelli, so on and so forth, uh, mix and match. We have so many games, but um, I would think he's going to be in that first 11, right or left. I mean, I think if you're spending that type of outlay, it almost has to be. And mm-hmm. so whether it's left wing or right wing, like you said, I think the key thing is that what we know, what Mikel wants is that interchangeability, is that versatility. So, and I think that gives them a lot of <clears throat> options to be able to play in different ways and really confuse defenses with that versatility. So I think it's going to be really, really interesting. I, I, obviously we know with, with Arteta and Edu, if they didn't, if they didn't have a detailed, if Mikel didn't have a detailed rationale for it, they wouldn't be moving like this for Rafinha. So I'm yeah. sure he has a plan and he knows trying to, you know, very, very well 
strengths and weaknesses of these guys and what they're able to adapt to and not adapt to. So it's, I mean, it's certainly an interest, interesting fit because that radar, the heat map, excuse me, very well, I mean, very well kind of fits Saka. So it's an interesting, certainly in that idea, but I'm, I think you're really looking, I think everything we've seen from Mikel this summer and we'll get into it with Lissandra Martinez on a future video is you're looking for versatility guys who can really interchange and play in multiple different ways and do it fluidly. I think Rafinha potentially fits that as well. I think that experience playing on the left side certainly benefits him in that regard. I think the hardest part, like you said, is it's adapting for players because, you know, like you said, Saka favors a left foot, Rafinha favors a left foot. So you have to really adapt your playing style side to side. So if you are moving fluidly side to side, it then changes how comfortable you are or what you're looking for, right? Which if you do it well, can be extremely effective, right? Because dude, if you're, if I'm a center back from a, a side back and I'm seeing different guys and I have to adjust my defensive style all the time, that makes it really difficult, right? If they're able to do it well. So that's, I think that's what Mikel is looking for. And it'll be a really interesting experience in that regard. And then lastly, do you think, this is just pure hypothetical. Do you think a deal gets done here for Rafinha? You know, I mean, I think we're all we're all pretty gun shy as Arsenal fans. Uh, to say that. Too much of anything, but I would say, I mean, I would say that the narrative seems to be really positive toward Arsenal getting this done. Um, it does not seem like he is particularly hot to join Spurs. Uh, it seems like uh, Barcelona are not going to figure out their finances quickly enough. And and even if they do, you know, they're being linked to like Jules Kounde, they're being linked to Lewandowski. So mm -hmm. um, they might have some bigger priorities. Uh, so I think that's why Arsenal are all over this kind of similar to how they got in on Vlaovic because they knew that this was the time that they could actually get him. That, that all looks good. And uh, I, I do actually have the feeling that it probably will happen. Um, the only the only thing I could really see messing up the deal is if Chelsea decide to come in. Um, but it seems like they're off to a positive start with Raheem Sterling. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. And you know, last thing for me is just like I feel like just the everything seems to be aligning in that regard. Like if Barcelona had the monetary funding, he'd be gone there. And that's his clear want and desire, right? He wants to play for that club, but. Not only do they have the financial issues, like you said, but they have other areas they need to address, right? Striker, um, Lewandowski, they need, obviously, they're going for Koundé. Um, the they reason the why they're, try, they're, trying to keep, they're trying to keep Dembele for a reason, because they don't want to pay a transfer fee when they don't have the money, right? And, I mean, Dembele is a great player when he's healthy as well. So, it makes sense in that regard. And then, like you said, Chelsea going after Raheem Sterling, you know, right, with City being willing to move him on as well everything certainly seems to be lining up and it seems like the club is going through you know the, the normal not normal but the negotiations are, start, are really starting to heat up when it comes to Rafinha and it sounds like he wants something to be done earlier rather than later which of course mm -hmm. it helps Arsenal in this case as well because of the Barcelona financials potentially with um what's his name completely blanking moving to uh United Oh, Frankie Dion. Yeah, yeah, Frankie Dion moving completely blanked on him. Because that could potentially boost their financial situation as well. But we'll see in that regard. We'll see what happens with Rafinha as well. I'm sure I think it's going to get done in relatively sooner rather than later because of he's pushing to know that. But we'll see. Any other closing thoughts? Um, yeah, actually, I do have one. Uh Ob the obvious, um, the obvious parallel that I think the more negative Arsenal, the more uh, pessimistic Ars Arsenal supporters are going to want to make here is to, is to Pepe. Um, and it's, I mean, sure, it's interesting. They both, they both played in France at some point in their career. They both favor the right. They both favor their left foot. They're both, you know, very comp friendly, dribbly players. I do think that there are some significant differences with their, uh, both their play styles, but also just, uh, their kind of statistical backgrounds before they came to Arsenal or sorry, before they, well, hypothetically before they come to Arsenal, right. Uh, just, just for the record. So people know when you're watching this um, Pepe in France was averaging about double the turnovers um, that 
Rafinha averaged in France. Rafinha doesn't even hit the Pepe France numbers in England, which to me is a much harder, uh, much harder league to keep the ball. The other thing is that Pepe, um, he scored a lot of goals uh, this, the year before he got his move. He also got a lot of assists the year before he got his move. That was an outlier season for him in France. Uh, whereas you look at Rafinha, he's had about half of a, an expected goal plus expected assists per 90 minutes. Um, so for perspective, that among wingers in the Premier League this past season would have been about 90th percentile. He's done that three years in a row um, going back to France. So he's consistent uh, as far as his output goes. So I think that those are the two things that really separate the two players for me, just because I know that comparison is going to happen as soon as he signs, um, if it happens. And it's obviously a very similar fee. Um, But I also think that, you know, it being three years later and the fee being actually less than Pepe is kind of a good thing, too, although it is high. Yeah, I never I never really understood any of those comparisons in the first place. I hadn't even really heard that many. Maybe I've just had a better job of muting and quieting my timeline than you have at this point. But uh, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, as always, um, Raj, you can find me at 3CB Performance. You can find Adam on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening and watching as always and catch y'all next time.